is uh, Bob Redman. He is with the 11th Hour um, Productions, and they promote literary arts, uh, emphasizing literary aspects of the arts. And he has published Antarctica, a um, book of love poems. And he works as a music director for KBCS Jazz Radio. Uh, and he also runs Seattle Poetry Festival at the Richard Hugo House. Uh, and today he will read a poem titled The Poet. Bob? Thanks, Nick. Um, since this is the first time, I want briefly to say thank you to the committee for this opportunity. It's, it's a very different venue from what any poet that I know is, is accustomed to, but I think that it will be good for the poets. And um, so today I wanted it's to read for this. for us as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, as sort of a um, honoring of, of the very common things that really hold us together and, and also to honor the work that you're doing on the Culture, Arts, and Parks Committee. I'm going to read um, this. For anyone who's ever babysat and... Um, or had to babysit. And it was a it was a post bumbershoot poem. I should probably say that. After the famous poets read, I they and the locals schmooze, but I and my backstage pass leave from the back of the back gate. We leave their false loud laugh, and even their well meaning banter, their after work rant and rave. They say, I loved your stuff. Are you a writer? Hey, we should really get together sometime. I leave the networking. I leave the hard the tongue. It's her future tense. She's full with the cadence of Tracy Morris, of Bob Holman, of Everton Sylvester, of Naomi Shehab Nye. Bye-bye, poets, I say. I won't shake your hand. I won't sign your book. You won't even see your own until later. Right now, they're either memory or longing. But I go home with the poem itself. So here it is. A Wordsworth, Wordsworth curated, curated by, by Bob Redman. Hello. Thanks. Thanks. Um, today's uh, poem is by Phoebe Boucher, who's um, sitting here next to me. She's the co-founder and man managing editor for the past seven years of the Raven Chronicles, which is a literary magazine based here in Seattle. She also performed with uh, a group called Coincidences of the Realm with Bill Shively and Michael Monhart. Her poetry has appeared most recently in Durable Breath, Contemporary Writing by Native Americans, and uh, she also co-edits the Raven's online magazine, which is uh, part of the Speakeasy Org website. And her recent performances were at Hedgebrook Writers' Colony, Native American Annual Writers' Festival, and the Globe Cafe, and in the past she has performed at Bumbershoot Literary Arts Festival, and the Alternative to Loud Votes, which she helped found. So, um, <laughs> right, please um, lend your ears to Phoebe Boucher. She's reading a piece called Tall Tales. The beginning. I believed. They believed. They who governed, who set the rules of the game, that the huddled masses would stop their yearning. They once the shores of Manhattan reached, that of the people by the people meant that one person was a special interest unto his or her own self, not just a vote from the cemetery. I believe ideas can be solid enough to die for if necessary. Though it is easier watching Errol Flynn do it gallantly with his boots on and U.S. 2nd Calvary storming to his defense, but not in time to upstage as one man stand against all the Plains Indians, plus Geronimo. I still believe, even though I found the last buffalo captured on one side of a nickel in the back pocket of yesterday's engine lying dead drunk, on a bench in Pioneer Square beneath that great bronze monument to Chief Seattle. Today's poet is Rajni Edens, who is um, a 17-year-old high school senior. He's been writing for six years already, and um, he was also a former member of the original African American Writers Alliance in Seattle. He's an honor student at Middle, Ho Middle College High School and uh, is a former member of Seattle's Urban Scholars and has also supported the community as a volunteer peer counselor. Additionally, Rajni has played big brother to more than 25 foster children and uh, also has one younger adopted brother. And um, he's a rapper. He reads and writes a lot. And in fact, he will be publishing a book um, in just a few months. So please lend your ears to Rajni Edens. 
This piece is entitled, The Ocean and the Sky's Reunion. Close your eyes and imagine you are the sky and the clouds passing, and I am the ocean, the rivers, and the seas, everlastingly patient, waiting for the day that we would meet and greet each other with the silent, complete emotion of devotion. The ocean and the sky's reunion shall be soon. Then I began to make my journey upward, gathering and extending myself while you distantly commenced to aid my rising with the lowering of your clouds and the dispersing of your rains in various areas. And I, continuously immersing all obstacles, continued my ascension, submerging sands of the beaches to the far reaches of roads of the cities, fluently, fluidly crooning your name in a chorus as I shrouded forest after forest, miles above the shores that were once my boundaries, we created fountains, surpassed mountains, until I delivered my praise with the swirling spray. The phrase was emitted out of my restless waters. A soft gurgling, we are together, was heard. Then we embraced, caressed, cooed, confessed that we were blessed with each other's presences for only a short time and shortly I would be receding. So confident in the belief that this was not our last meeting, I succumbed to the ebbing of my flow and allowed the winds to blow you slowly upward because I knew we would meet again. Thank you. Today's poet is Arthur Tooley and uh, he was born and raised on the Yakima Indian Reservation and graduated from uh, Western, I mean, uh, Washington State University in 1990 with a BA in English. He currently lives in Seattle and works as a technical editor in Bellevue. And Arthur has been published in regional and national publications, including Bumbershoot's Ergo magazine, which features performers from the event. Also, the Raven Chronicles, the Seattle Arts Commission newsletter, and Ziziva's issue on West Coast writers and artists. He's also performing at this weekend's Seattle Poetry Festival on Saturday at 5.30, and there's uh, complete schedules up there on the um, counter for you to take home with you. Arthur Tuley. Uh, thank you, Bob. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to Councilman Nakata, uh, Councilwoman uh, Sue Donaldson, and uh, Councilman uh, Mr. Steinberg, and all of you here in the audience today. Uh, I'm reading this poem for two reasons. One is for my family, and the other is for the Seattle Indian community. <coughs> it's called Saving Face. Here among the dozens of wall-mounted photographs of Northwest Indians is my face, not my face, as if I stood or sat for a pose in traditional clothing, as if I could leave this nose, this chin, these eyes, this soul to anybody but family to own. But still, there it is, my face, every time I eat here. I make a point to see my face, have never considered avoiding my face, and was never surprised to find my face among these dead. I touch the glass my face is under, and I read the inscription under the frame as if it were new each time, every time. Yakima Indian, identity unknown, circa 1898. On my 11th visit, eating my 11th alder plank salmon, I notice for the first time that my face is beautiful on a woman's body. I feel my heart shoot the rapids of my genetic homeland. I know my family member will be set free. She will no longer be kept apart from her family. She will be home soon. I can't help but think what I would do to feed my family in those early reservation days when starvation and poverty were older members of the family. But I pass no judgment on survival, on the necessary and the sacrificial. On my 12th visit, I take action. I strip to my breech cloth and I paint my face in the parking lot and carry a hunting knife between my teeth. Shadowless, I slip through the double doors, walk invisibly past the hostess station, 
and stalk down a sloped floor to my face. And deftly, I cut it down from its 25-year perch. And with salmon cooking all around us, I say a prayer large in meaning, short in duration. And I carry my back straight and my eyes chew and step out in God's broad daylight and save two faces this day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, which is uh, curated by Bob Redman. Bob, would you like to introduce our poet today? Sure, thanks. Um, hello, today's poet is Salem, who um, as a teenager volunteered at COCA and on the boards and rediscovered um, a literary expression anyway while she was working on an irrigation crew in Kingston in 1994 and uh, faced insults from, from other members of the crew. So re she retaliated against that by writing prose poems, eventually signed up for a slam at the Central Tavern, pretty much swept the crowd, became um, one of the favorites of the live reading scene, was discovered at the Blue Moon by the editors of Point No Point, um, who invited her to write for Point No Point. She also writes for The Stranger. Her performance credits are many, and she's appeared in many venues, including The Weathered Wall, The Rendezvous, and The Tractor. Uh, just last month, she gave a really wonderful reading at the Seattle Poetry Festival, and it's really a pleasure to um, have Salem here today. Please lend your ears to Salem. Uh, I composed a book of poems that I call Annularis, which are eight poems uh, about the annual seasonal cycle. So the poem I'm going to read for you today uh, celebrates the spring equinox. <clears throat> In the end, there is no end, but to begin again, Ananas, Pomosis. Out from the sleeve of dawn day dew, out from the black magic of winter's dirt, dirt, we see the world renewed. No small trick. And in you, of summer solstice conceived, and vernal equinox born, I have blissed on the tail of daffodil and pomegranate's quarry. The sweetening of life, the candy of the land, of spring, dawn, and morn. Call it floral shock or sweet brown chocolate. Call it Wonka vision or Edenic Ananas Camosis. Call it mad medicine mood spring or mudslide. No daffodil need decide just how to heliotrope. All time knows the ropes. Dig, dig the turning tides. Dig the wealth of earth on this the year's first morn. The poet is Bart Baxter. It's really a pleasure to have Bart here today because he does so many things. Um, not only well established as a writer on the page, he's a very well polished and known performer, publishes and also mentors young and emerging poets. Bart has recently read his poetry for the Distinguished Poets series, sponsored by the NEA, also for the MTV Spoken Word Tour and the Washington State House of Representatives. He has appeared at the New Eureka Poets Cafe in New York and the Green Mill in Chicago. He has also won the 1994 Hart Crane Award, the 1994 Charles Proctor Award, the 95 Carlin Aiden Award, the 97 William Stafford Award, and the 1994 MTV Grand Slam, in addition to winning Seattle's Grand Slam for this year, for whom he'll represent, uh, he'll represent Seattle in Austin at the Poetry Slam Nationals. His, uh, his work has appeared in The Formalist, The Ohio Poetry Review, The Kansas Quarterly, and over 40 poetry journals. Two volumes of his poetry have been published. They are Driving Wrong and Peace for the Arsonist. Today, Bart is going to uh, recite his poem, Woe and Tattoo. Bart. This is a poem about my son who plays the trumpet. Tackles cracked, buckled glass, rain worked against the window. My head held low at some angle appropriate to be in 
jacked up and ripped off by some union disciple, some cackling hack idiot with a beer belly brain and an attitude let loose, beat me down, bit me double, scared me penniless, sheep shanked and ripped up like the ratty old rags in a yellowing sofa. In my head felt the aches of the bad crapped out gambles and rotten mistakes backed out and backed down with bad knees and bad knuckles, drawing faces to 12, dealer sitting on 20. When from out of the blue, from the bedroom upstairs, come a B-flat staccato blowing, bebop, and dizzy blowing, Maynard blowing, scat blowing, barking and bitching and booting up with the low moan of Dixie like a psalm in cut glass, like an arc welder's torch burning in and come blistering long linear notes reaching higher and higher like a tracer, like a flare set off. My boy was upstairs. He was blowing the roof off. He was blowing the doors off of Jericho. He was blowing tattoo at an old buoy tender, blowing tattoo at a bunk in the bow of an icebreaker at the floor of the flight deck in the wake of a steamer, in the wake of a cutter, at the wake of a flyer, gunned down like a drive-by in the fog over Antioch, faced with failure, fatigue, and we drank till we fell over, knocked over bottles and felt up the XO's wife. I said, Gabriel, get down. She was blowing that too. And I come undone in the whiskey wet winters begging mercy, forgiveness for unprincipled actions, unspeakable agonies brought down on myself like a seven day rainfall, unbearable, unending, unhealing. All the ills done to others, unimagined atrocities like a big piece of broken glass eaten by accident, but nonetheless fatal. When from out of the blue, from the bedroom upstairs, come an angel on horn, come a serious high note like a wire between me and the Lord God Almighty, between me and the archangel. He has saved me, forgiven me, taken up crosses in the wash of a jazz riff. He has given me Pentecost in a pitiful world, come a boy on horn, come an angel in turtleneck from the bedroom upstairs, blowing Dixieland, Dorothy like salvation. He was blowing tattoo like a gospel evangelist, like a riverbed baptism. He was holding me under where the water and blood rush come speaking in tongues come together. Come Gabriel. I was crying tattoo because I love him so much. So be kind to my boy. I say, heaven, help the horn man. Keep him safe in dark alleys. Keep him paid by the hour. Keep his embouchure holy and his luck at the shoe. Hitting 12, drawing nines at a soft 17. Heaven, sure to be kind. He was blowing tattoo. Who is um, a very accomplished teacher as well as a writer. She has a new chapbook called Kick Pleat in the Cosmos, released by Quinn Teaches Press. She teaches at the UW Extension at Antioch University, the Richard Hugo House, through Seattle Arts and Lectures, and also at Seattle Area High Schools. And she's a science teacher, which will be definitely evident in today's poem. And um, she's also a contributing writer for The Stranger and for Wordscape. Last year, she co-wrote and produced a radio play with, uh, in collaboration with Jack Straw Productions, and her poetry has appeared in Poetry Northwest, Field, Nimrod, Hubbub and numerous other publications. Um, another thing that is well known about Jan Wallace is that she was a student of Denise Levertov's, um, one of the preeminent, preeminent poets of this century, and um, later became her secretary and then her friend, and definitely the, um, the grace of Denise Levertov is, is certainly part of Jan's um, work ethic and her, her craft, her art as well. So it's a great pleasure to have Jan Wallace here. Please lend your ears to Jan Wallace. Um, so this is what, you know, when bald eagles mate, this is what they do. Midair, they just come together like that and they quit flying and they just go like this until they almost crash and then they go apart. So this is called ornithology lesson. It's an act of desperation, the rare mating ritual of the bald eagle pair. They come together mid-air between mountains. You can barely make them out. 
you with your Autobahn binoculars, you in your birding hat. The two of them bound beak and feather, claw and wing, having taken leave of every other instinct like survival, like hunger when they caught that scent floating in thin air. Mostly what they have forgotten is how to breathe, how to fly. They drop their wings, admit to the full weight of themselves, washed clean of the serendipitous magic of everyday bald eagle flight by the thick, true wash of lust, which brings every creature right down out of the wild kingdom into the one common, humble denominator. Aren't you glad, bird watchers, you're not a part of that? Those eagles risk it all for the free fall down the long swallow of sex, speeding down the chimney of air, plummeting blindly toward earth, unaware, entranced, careening toward your keen eyes riveted on the speeding bundle. And just when you know this must be a suicide pact, no bird heart promise but the real thing among a noble breed, just before the, they hit the earth and scatter like burst pillows, they disengage slow motion in a stunning, artful gesture. And there you are, binoculars around your ankles as the eagles pick up the next breeze, feathering, feathering, and soar. Thank you. Thank you. Worth curated by Bob Rigger. Hello, thanks, Nick. Pleasure. Today's poet is Tracy Hall, who this month celebrates three years in Seattle. Yep. She was raised in the Watts area of Los Angeles and has lived all over the U.S. since. She wrote her first poem when she was 12 years old on a paper bag to protest her mother's prohibition of the word ain't. <laughs> and um, she continues to write poetry to challenge authority and to say things that are otherwise unsayable. Tracy has written and co-directed two plays in Los Angeles and New Haven. Her poems have appeared in several underground magazines and were featured in Testimony, an anthology of young African-American writers. She's also the recipient of an Artist Trust grant and a Hedgebrook residency. She works at the Seattle Public Library downtown branch with young people. Please lend your ears to Tracy Hall. Mm. Uncle Tall Twain. Oh, but on a Tuesday, a small day, an inconsequential day of the week, saying nothing about the hope for new beginnings, nor the weariness of endings all the same, I will think of you just as I think of you now, sitting, grinning on the porch, rubbing the gritty edge of a shiny quarter between your index finger and your thumb. I will think of all the cherry soda drank in your company at your expense, the gleam in your eye anticipating my belched appreciation, the way you never turned your head disapprovingly to the side when in my eagerness I answered the door, dressed in grandma's slip with hair uncombed, and the way you always said yes, 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 when I offered you what in another life would have passed for something edible. And when everyone else made it known that my childhood opinions were not welcome in a living room full of grown-up problems, you would run your hand quietly over my head as I quietly exited. And before you left the house each time, you'd call me to the screen door and say in a voice that sounded sincere that you'd be looking forward to the next visit. And I remember waiting in the back of your station wagon while Bessie handed out her Medi-Cal stickers in exchange for another painless week. And me interrupting you reading the paper to ask if you could change the radio station whenever a song I didn't like came on. Doing it so much, I could see you were getting tired and you saying that it wasn't any bother at all. And I remember you taking an extra long time to sit and talk with the children on holidays when we were consigned to the kitchen table while the adults ate in the dining room. And even in those days when I really didn't have anything important to say, at least I don't think I did, 
I remember feeling that though I was yet young, I was important to you. And it made me feel good when you asked about my schoolwork or my thoughts about the weather and patiently listened through my rambling and exhaustive accounts of fifth grade life. And you know, it is hard to believe that this is how it ends. It is hard to think that after everything, this is the way it ends, that your kindness did not render you immortal. But on another day, a small day, a day which exists in between the days that create the years, I will remember you. I will remember you. And I will remember always to remember. Thank you. Today's poem um, is called Hollow Streets. Hollow Streets. Just lit my mind for a moment. And it will be read by uh, Michael Hood, who you might have heard on NPR as a commentator for All Things Considered. Uh, he also writes for Garrison Keillor's show, A Prairie Home Companion. His work has appeared in the Utney Reader, in the Weekly, in Pacific Magazine, and The Stranger, and many other places. He's also a food editor and contributing writer for Point No Point, the um, literary magazine, and has been on the Seattle National Slam team of 1996 and 1997 when he was its Grand Slam champion. Michael is a native of Ferndale, and I found out this interesting thing yesterday, that he was a town councilman in Laconner. So a wealth of experience uh, from Michael Hood. Please lend your ears to hear his poem. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for I I uh, asking me here today. And I think that poetry is the missing element in city government. And I applaud you for this. You know, my kid's name is Milo, and he's 10. And like me, he's a small town boy with a taste for city lowlife. Weekends when Milo comes to town, we hang the alleys and stalk the derelict streets, window shopping for lives we'd hate. We're drawn by the sheer lack of sheen and the shite-stained desperation. We watch with eyes in the dead light as the souls with no socks, wearing their homes on their feet, pissing their pants to stay warm. They're living in the tunnel at the end of the light, asking blessings from nothing. They shuffle through the empties in wind like broken glass. This is our Disneyland when Milo comes to town. We're tourists slumming, dazzled by degradation. There's a winter Sunday gray in the financial district, and the dregs of the dregs were there, and the women with faces in blood and men named Lightning. And they were and we were the only animals to be found there in the canyon lands, the cement void left by the bankers and the paper pimps rolled off Friday afternoon in their Reeboks and their top sirloin cars, and it was dreadful silent. We could hear the moans from the wounded from the Indian camp up on Jackson Street. Hollow streets, empty even when full of these so-called human beings. Look, Milo. His eyes are holes like a skull's. Cool, says Milo. Where the bus stop, clothes dumped on the ground, shaving kit all speckled with toothpaste residue, Milo rifles the stuff, but it's, it's old man stuff. There's nothing to have here for a boy. Stop, I say. This is the end of a life. No man leaves his shaving gear and his extra pair of pants on the street if he intends to live. This is a grave, Milo. These things are useless to you, but this is a home life scattered and stomped. These are personal effects, impersonal and ineffective, like a pile of dentures in a Holocaust camp stripped of their gold and rifled by children. This man is dead, Milo. And see, in his underwear on the street, we're known him better than anyone has in years, and I regret ever meeting him. And I'm sorry my son was exposed to his lack. And I'm sorry my son was exposed to namelessness. I'm sorry my son was exposed. I'm sorry, my son, for this looted life for effects with no cause, like dogs with no names, to lives that end where weekends begin. And I repent what I own, and I reject what I see, and I deny what I know, 
and I wish we'd stayed home and watched TV, for now I feel as hollow as any wino or banker, so let's go play some video games. Want to? Okay, Milo? Thank you.